we know the kids are ready. And the question is, are we ready to really help those kids have the opportunities that we know how to give them? Hi, I'm Nat Malkus, resident fellow uh, in education policy at the American Enterprise Institute. Today, I've got a conversation with Steve Routenbush of the University of Chicago on his new book, The Ambitious Elementary School. Steve, it's great to have you here. Thanks for uh, the Ambitious Elementary School is a fantastic book. Uh, I, I just can't recommend it enough. Um, it's, it's really challenging in a number of ways, so just to lay out the basics, uh, it chronicles uh, the organization of two University of Chicago charter schools uh, on the south side of Chicago, North Kenwood, Oakland, and, and Donahue. And uh, the schools are organized uh, ambitiously in two ways. One, they have ambitious goals for student outcomes and student learning. But it's also ambitious in uh, the bold design of the schools to depart from sort of the traditional organizations that we have sort of become used to. So can you just give us a layout of the, the basic systems uh, underlying these schools? Yeah, well, the ambition for the, for the kids, of course, is we're talking about kids who are African-American kids, 85% low income, who historically have been behind in achievement. And who, so the idea is that the school is going to bring those kids up to being equal with more middle class kids, uh, kids who are non-minority kids. So that's a huge ambitious goal. The kids are uh, like kids anywhere, very heterogeneous. They come into school at all different levels. And so this project of catching up the kids when the kids are actually heterogeneous, this is a challenging problem for people in any school. But also, the teachers have different levels of experience and skill. So they are also heterogeneous. And to do this hard work of helping these kids catch up, the teachers have to be operating at a really high level. So that means teachers have a lot to learn, and the, the teachers who know the most have to somehow be able to help the teachers who don't know as much learn more so that everybody can be effective in doing this. So that's a big project. Uh, and uh, part of the strategy is to keep very close track of every kid. So to know where every child is in reading and math and other areas. Um, kids are assessed every 10 weeks. Um, they're all over the place. You make an instructional plan for every single child. For every child, not just every child, child. with special needs. The child is, is down here. Where is that child going to be in 10 weeks? How is that child going to get up to where that child needs to be? The kids up here, how does that ch child go farther? How do the kids at the very top go even higher? You know, so you're not going to focus on kids who are having trouble at the expense of kids who are, who are, who are higher. Or, or look only at the high flyers and, and ignore the, low, the, the lower achieving kids. Everybody's going to move up. So you're going to test these kids. You're going to have an instructional plan for each child. And 10 weeks later, you're going to assess them again, and you're going to ask, did the instructional plan actually work? And if it didn't work, what were we doing wrong? How are we going to make it work? We're going to have a new instructional plan. Right. One of the things uh, in the book that's evident is how wide a web of support you create for these kids. And one of the challenges that struck me, how does this model work, is trying to distribute the information about right. each kid right. to everybody throughout. And this is not just teachers on a grade level. Right. It's teachers, uh, support professionals, right. the, the school leaders, all the way down to the extended day people. That's right. Um, so how do they manage information in, uh, in such a demanding uh, network. No, that's really a key to the whole thing, is, is to, have a, to have an information system that's constantly being updated and that's accessible to everybody. So a teacher can walk into the principal's office and see where that teacher's children are, every single one of those kids, and where every other child in the school is. So a second grade teacher can see where her teacher, her kids are and see where other second grade kids are. She can see whether her kids are moving on this assessment and whether other kids are moving. And if kids aren't moving, there's going to be some kind of a conference to figure out how are we going to get them to move. The parents, uh, are, uh, the school brings the parents in and say, your child is at step eight. We, ne ten weeks from now, we're going to expect your child's going to be at step nine in reading. Here's what you can do to help. 
So these, the printouts of this have to be then made available to the parents. Um, and you're right, the, the social workers are involved in uh, understanding the achievement, uh, the achievement of, ki of the kids. They have a plan for the social development of the kids. It's a, it's a very demanding information system. And getting people to use the information and to collaborate uh, and to understand how to use that system is a whole part of what we think of as teacher expertise or social worker expertise. It's how you use the system. It's not whether you have a, a high SAT score or you went to a fancy college. It's do you know how to use, can you use this system in your instruction? Right. You know, that points to a, a pretty interesting departure, uh, at least from a lot of the literature and writings I've read on teachers in economics, right? The idea in economics is, well, if we can just move the distribution of teacher quality up, right, right. Um, it, it's sort of like almost as if we can replace teachers like widgets. Right. But this system has a very different vision. It starts with distributed leadership uh, uh, across the school, not just for the principal, but also from a, other teachers. Right. And then the, the other component that I find compelling, but also a challenge, is sort of an open door policy. Not as an empty policy, but where it's normal for teachers to have other people come in come and observe, the give yeah. them feedback, and, and, and grow. So as opposed to uh, sort of getting inputs and putting them in place, there's a, a real development process. Exactly. Yeah. So just tell me how that works in right. the school. So one way to say this is you have to have a way of defining expertise and, and, and they have to have a way of revealing it. And you have to have a way of enabling the more expert teachers to help the less expert teachers gain expertise. I mean, you've got to start with the idea, everybody's not the same. People come in with different backgrounds, different experiences. They've been doing this for different amounts of time. So it's very natural to think that people would have different levels of expertise. And it's a little bit uncomfortable to, for everybody to, to know who's really good at doing this and who's, who's not as good. But if everybody has an incentive to get better, then the person who needs, you know, who's a newer person, hasn't learned the system yet, wants to learn that system, that person's going to want to have an expert person helping them. And when a person's really good at it and con consistently produces good data for their children, and that person has actually learned how to not only teach well, but help somebody else teach better, then that person is going to be having more responsibility and is, is going to have uh, some reward for doing that as well. So there's going to be a, some career advancement within teaching as you get better at doing it and you can help other people do it. You can advance uh, in your profession without leaving the classroom. This has been a problem in education. Sure. The only way you could get ahead was to get out of the classroom and become an administrator. Well here, and, and by the way I should say, if you become an administrator, you're still part of the instructional system. In fact, you're a crucial part of it because you're an instructional leader in that system and it's the people who've worked within that system and thrived within that system and who've shown a track record of helping other people who become leaders in that same system and who continue to uh, provide leadership for, for other teachers. Right, more than managing a building or a exactly. set of human resources. Yeah, there's a, so the idea is to have a chief operating officer who's going to take care of that work and create a kind of division of labor so that the director of the school is mainly an instructional leader. Yeah, you know, there's an interesting, I find a really compelling I idea in the book. And I I'll tell you, the book is packed with information, so there's no way that we can cover it all. Right, right. Uh, <laughs> one of the ideas was this idea, your use of the word infrastructure. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea that uh, in some more centralized education systems, there's a lot more infrastructure. But typically in American public schools, uh, we have a pretty decentralized system. And part of this is the view of teachers where they're sort of broken off and they're, they can close their door and, and, and do what they do in their room and sort of have this isolated expertise. Um, but what informs a lot of this school model is uh, infrastructure that may be hard to come by. So uh, how, in your words, what do you mean by infrastructure and then who might supply it in a decentralized education system? Right, because what, within a school we talked about some of the infrastructure, having an assessment system, having textbooks, having people who can coach and who can help other people get better. That's infrastructure that helps a person get better. But if you look between schools, 
You don't want every school individually to have to reinvent the wheel and create a powerful instruction system. If other people have learned how to do this and we have textbooks that work and we have uh, methods of assessment, and we have tools that work, technological tools, you were talking about having an information system, you wouldn't want every school to have to invent that. That would be just crazy. Once you know how to do that, you want to make it more widely available. How is that going to happen? Well, it could happen through a local school district. It could happen through a charter management organization. Universities, we think, could play a much bigger role in partnership with schools in helping supply infrastructure because one thing about scholars, they all are trying to figure out what's going on all over the place. What do we know? And what works best? They have, you know, presumably we were able to get our hands in some evidence about that. Making that accessible in a usable way through usable tools to people who are trying to make schools work is, has a lot of potential that we're not exploiting right now, we think. So I, I don't want to bury the lead here. You've got some results. Right. Uh, can you just give us a thumbnail on, first of all, how you know what you know about the outcomes of these students and give us some perspective on how big they are. Right, yeah, sure. Well, the reason we know is um, we're very fortunate that um, every year in each of the schools and in each grade, people come and apply for the school and there are more people applying than there are seats. And so admission to school, the school is decided by a randomized lottery. So what that means is that we have for these schools, we have statistically equivalent group of kids who win the lottery and therefore go to the school and another group of kids who lose the lottery and therefore don't go to the school. So that means that we can make uh, fair, uh, objective comparisons of these two groups and make a determination of what is the impact of the school that's free of the usual biases that we see when we just look at achievement between two different schools. So that's right. a randomization, randomized lottery. It's kind of, we call it in social science, the gold standard for causal inference, okay? To try to really make these results plain, uh, let's think about two distributions. There's a distribution of test scores for all the white kids in Chicago. And there's a distribution of test scores for the black kids in Chicago. Okay, let's take the, the white kids. If I'm at the 50th percentile of the white distribution, I'm a white kid in Chicago, that means that I'm scoring below half the kids but above half the kids. I'm right, right in the middle of the distribution. Sure. Okay. And same thing, if I'm, in the black, if I'm a black kid, I'm maybe in the middle of the black distribution. So, so the question is, um, how do those two distributions compare if kids lose the lottery and as a result are not able to go to the charter school? Okay, and what we know is that the kid who's in the middle of the black distribution is going to be at the 26th percentile of the white distribution. Okay, so that means that the typical black kid is going to be outscored by 74% of the white kids. Okay, what we'd like to see is we'd like to see the black distribution move up and become the same as the white distribution. If it were, that would mean that a child at in the middle of the black distribution will be right in the middle of the white distribution. Right, sure. 50 50, be at the 50 percentile of the white distribution. What we see is that as a result of um, winning the lottery and attending the uh, charter school, that the black distribution moves from, up from the 26th percentile of the white distribution up to the 44th. So the typical kid who wins the lottery and attends the school is going to be at the 44th percentile of the white distribution. We'd want it to be 50, and we're not there. But we have moved a long way from 26 up to 40. Far more than half the achievement. Far, the, far more than half the achievement gap. And I want to say one other thing. When these kids leave the elementary school, this is, we were really surprised to see this. A lot of social science research would have predicted that those effects would fade out fade when they out, go to yeah. secondary school, because they're no longer under the care of this particular school, right. which is quite unusual. But what we see is quite the contrast. In fact, the effects increase. So these are not effects that fade out. These are effects that grow as kids move into that? secondary school. You know, that's fantastic. So. Uh, uh, I, I sort of approach a lot of my studies from the economic lens, which, I, you know, we talked about the benefits. Right. Can we talk a minute about the cost? Sure. Uh, and I, I know it may not be easy, but there's, there's sort of three things to talk about. One is just the funding. But beyond that, uh, you, it seems like you had two elements that, that also helped the University of Chicago schools. One is the University of Chicago, which right. sort of drew expertise yes. that would be expensive and uh, uh, is 
perhaps hard to estimate, but it still is. important. Right. And then there's also some other in-kind resources that it seemed to get that weren't from the university, that were uh, you know, from the community and so forth. So can you just give us a thumbnail also on the, the resource side? Sure. Well, very basically, these are, un these are uh, Chicago public schools. And although they are formally charter schools, they're funded with regular per pupil expenditures from, for the Chicago public schools. And so uh, if you know about Chicago public schools, the funding is not high uh, compared to a lot of other urban districts, New York, uh, DC, Boston, many other urban districts. Right. So it's, it's a pretty low funded district. Uh, and so we do, to run, to make this model work, we try to raise some extra money, mm -hmm. about $2,000 per pupil that, okay. would, that would bring, but that would bring the cost of educating these kids up to where, uh, actually still below where a lot of urban schools are, but, but a little bit closer. So it's, it's not, an, it, just in terms of outright expenditures, it's not uh, a, an overly expensive model by any stretch of the imagination. Right. But as you pointed out, and this is an excellent point, there are hard to measure advantages that the school gains by working closely with the university, where the university is, in, we have something called the Urban Education Institute of the University of Chicago, is actually operating almost as a small district. We actually, I didn't mention, we actually have four charter schools, because we have a high school and another middle school, as well as these two elementaries. And the Urban Inst Education Institute does other things, and it has very good practitioners, as well as researchers. So that, um, benefit of, of, of being able to work closely uh, with the, the University of Chicago and helping de develop some new assessments, some new tools, some new coaching methods, some new, and using research, the university, we have access to other universities that do a really good job with reading instruction, sure. that, that have done research, and we've used those things. So we make those things available. So that's the thing that, uh, that we do that maybe a lot of other, talking about urban infrastructure, a lot of other districts might not be doing or some other organizations. But we think that uh, other institutions, um, like I say, charter school management systems or districts could do, could do more of that. And we also think there's a much bigger role for universities to play in, in making partnerships and cr helping generate the know-how for excellent schooling. Um, and I want to say one other thing. What we find when we work with uh, at the university, when we work with uh, teachers, we find wonderful people, exemplary people, teachers, who have incredible ideas. We can help those people get their ideas out. A lot of what you see in the book are actually quotes from just fantastic leaders in schools. Right. So by getting their word out, I mean, you know, practitioners aren't paid to tell the world what they know. Sure. They just do it. So universities can help make accessible to a broader range of people what great practitioners know. And we think that's another thing that universities c can do much more of. Well, perhaps a lot of universities that focus on teacher training can export a little teacher training to the schools and can uh, pro provide a little infrastructure in return. So that's... Uh, yeah, I think we setup. have to take a hard look at how we do teacher training and how we learn from the teacher training that we're doing. Um, I think we can do a lot better with that. It takes us kind of in a different direction, but because just having the experience we've seen where we take these kids who would have uh, perhaps really not fared so well and who were doing so well and knowing that they will tremendously respond if given the opportunity. It makes you want to think about everything you can do to ensure that every child has this kind of opportunity. There's, there's no, you know, as this, this is kind of the, the moral side of this for me is that, is, uh, is that we know the kids are ready and the question is are we ready to really help those kids have the opportunities that we know how to give them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that's a great point to end it on. Steve, thanks, thanks for coming uh, to AEI. Thanks for the book, and uh, I, I'm glad to have it on my shelf. Thanks for the invitation. Right. It's been a pleasure. Hey, everyone. That's the end of our discussion with Steve Roudenbush. Thanks for watching. As always, let us know what other topics you'd like AEI scholars to cover on Viewpoint. And be sure to check out the rest of our videos and research from AEI.